Okay, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, Kathy Hudson here. I introduced the topic briefly with a slide in my director's report, but um, we specifically wanted to have uh, Kathy come and talk to council. I know council would be interested in this topic, but also um, it really is an interesting chapter. I didn't even know what the title of her talk was going to be, but it really is an interesting story to be told how this played out. I will tell you, Kathy put in countless hours, if not days and days of effort uh, navigating a very complicated circumstance. Um, I and several of us from NHGRI, in particular Laura Rodriguez and Mark Geyer and a couple others were, were quite involved on a regular basis on phone calls with Kathy as she sort of used us as, as uh, partners and but as advisors and helped to sort of navigate what was a much more complicated course for her than it was for us. But I saw enough of the front line of the story to just see how challenging it was and Kathy was just masterful at it in many ways. I also think that the, the perspective that she co-authored with Francis, although I'm sure she did most of the writing, um, was fantastic in the end and um, if you haven't read that you really should. But I'm going to let her just tell this story but I really thought it would be special. The timing couldn't be any better for a council presentation directly from Kathy on this interesting story. So Kathy. Thanks Eric for the um, invitation. Um, and it's nice to be here with you all with some uh, uh, friendly, familiar faces around the table in the back of the room. Um, thanks very much. So this is a, um, has been an interesting story to be a part of over the last um, several months. I'll start with, uh-oh. Uh yeah. So I will start with a little bit of uh, background, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, about um, Henrietta Lacks. Um, she was born in 1920 at uh, the young age of 31. She was being treated at Hopkins for an aggressive form of cervical cancer. Um, researchers took cells um, from her and ended up being able to successfully start uh, a cell line, uh, the first human cell line, uh, as it turns out. Um, the family, of course, has been dealing with this situation ever since they learned that their mother's cells had been uh, used in this way. Um, so how, how her identity became known and how the family's identity became known, I think, is, uh, is uh, relevant here. So uh, in 1951, George Guy uh, at Hopkins was able to get the HeLa cell line to grow in culture. In 1971, there was a um, uh, commentary, actually an obituary, published in Obstetrics and Gynecology that identified Henrietta Lacks and included uh, a photograph of her. The obituary was um, of um, George Guy, and it was written by Howard Jones, who is otherwise known to many of you as the father of um, IVF. In 1976, uh, Victor McCusick, the father of human uh, medical genetics, published a paper describing um, the lax pedigree and specifically was looking at HLA, HLA typing because at the time it had become well known that many uh, later derived cell lines were contaminated with HeLa. And so if you get any cell line near HeLa, HeLa takes over. Um, and so uh, Victor McCusick and his team contacted family members and had them come back to Johns Hopkins to provide blood samples. If you've read the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, you get a perspective of how um, there was a lack of clarity uh, on the families, uh, from the family's perspective, in terms of what exactly they were being asked to provide and why. Uh, so there was a perception that they were being tested to find out whether or not they might have the same uh, disease that their mother died of. In 1997, there was a documentary, and then uh, probably most importantly for the general public's understanding of this, uh, in, uh, this situation and identification of who the family uh, is and who Henrietta Lacks was, was the publication in 2010 of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. So how many people in the room have read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks? It seems like you can't even get on an airplane nowadays without seeing somebody reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, so, uh, so it's very, very, very uh, widely known. So uh, if you do a Google search today for uh, HeLa, you'll generate 2.5 million uh, results. There have been 74,000 scientific publications using HeLa cells and mentioning that. Um, in the last 10 years, most of the Nobel Prizes have used HeLa cells as a part of their work. Um, and. Uh, 
even our youngest scientists, of course, are using HeLa cells. And here are two examples from the Intel Science Search and from the Siemens competition. So um, I don't think that many of us, you know, all of us read the book, but I don't think many of us gave much thought uh, to what we were doing in our laboratories and the connection to the family um, until um, March of this year when researchers in Germany posted the first whole genome HeLa sequence uh, in EBI, and of course it was mirrored in NCBI. Um, fairly quickly, the Twitter world uh, lit up. Rebecca was aware that the sequence had been published. Rebecca Skloot, the author of the book, was aware that the sequence was uh, posted. She contacted the family, and the family requested that the sequence be taken down. And uh, in fact, the uh, authors agreed to have the sequence taken down, and it was taken down quite rapidly, both uh, from EBI and NCBI. <clears throat> As we started to look into the situation, we learned that there was another publication pending with Nature that was funded by NHGRI. Of course, the um, German publication was not supported by NIH. So uh, there was an um, editorial that was published in the New York Times by Rebecca Skloot. And in the process of generating um, that, that op-ed, um, Rebecca reached out to her. And I knew her from my days at Johns Hopkins at the Genetics and Public Policy Center because she was a stringer for the Washington Post. And she wrote a very flattering article about the Genetics and Public Policy Center uh, soon after we launched. And we had uh, remained um, in contact ever since. So she talked to Frances Collins and myself and ended up uh, including a quote from Frances in her editorial. And during our conversations, we asked if she would connect us with the family. And she said she would think about that and talk to the family about it. And that was very important for uh, what's the rest of this story. So um, in thinking about how to address the problem of what to do with the sequence that had been taken down and what to do with the sequence that was uh, pending um, at Nature, um, we gave a lot of serious consideration to how to make sure that we generated a solution that was the right size for the problem. So not to create a solution that was uh, ginormous and um, sort of supersized, um, but not also to create a solution that was too modest for the importance of the situation. Um, <clears throat> So uh, in generating the solution to this problem, there were a lot of people who played really, really important roles, um, notably um, Eric, Mark Geyer, um, Brad, Laura, and uh, Larry uh, Thompson from the Genome Institute, as well as a slew of people from NCBI who were instrumental uh, in working with us and folks in the Office of the Director. And this was also a topic of conversation among the NIH leadership uh, on a number of occasions with the Institute directors from across the NIH. So we had an opportunity with the help from uh, folks at Johns Hopkins to meet with the family over a series of months. Um, and, um, and that was a, a fascinating experience. This is Francis taking a selfie. I had never heard of a selfie. That's how uh, un under a rock I live of um, uh, on the day that we announced our agreement with the Lax family at Johns Hopkins and standing directly next to Francis is Jerry Lax, uh, her brother David Lax. Uh, and their mother uh, standing there together. There were uh, many other members of the Lax family who were present when we announced our agreement. So um, on, I can't remember the date, and I don't have my glasses, so I can't say it. Um, so we managed to reach an agreement, which I will talk to you a little bit about, and also talk to you about how I think this agreement is something that's going to be uh, evolving, and your input and thoughts would be really welcome. Um, we did manage to reach an agreement, and um, Jason Dury's paper was published with the second full human genome sequence, a commentary by uh, Francis and I. And uh, at the same time, the German sequence was reposted, um, but this time in dbGaP. Uh, so uh, both the Shindori sequence and the German sequence were made available at the time of this publication. So over the course of our time with the um, Lax family, and, and let me just say a couple words about the Lax family. So um, the Lax family um, is multi-generational, and it was multi-generations that were participating in these discussions. Um, they uh, attended these meetings with me and Francis and a couple of folks from Hopkins over a period of months, um, where we began with trying to just uh, understand what the circumstance was. 
um, and then over time uh, working towards what would be the options for how we move forward and then what were the respective pros and cons, good, bad, and ugly of each of those options. Um, there were anywhere between nine and 12 family members at any given meeting and during the intervening times between our meetings they had discussions with their broader family and at the end of the day they had a consensus position which I think is a remarkable thing I can't reach a consensus agreement with my nuclear family about where to go to dinner <laughs> so they really you know enough they are a remarkable remarkable family so um, elements of the agreement so we uh, uh, opted to put the two whole assembled genomes into controlled access in dbGaP um, and uh, uh, require that researchers apply for access in order to get to that. And the terms for access that a researcher must agree to in order to get access is that they will use the sequence for biomedical research only, that they won't attempt to contact the family. Um, that they disclose whether they have uh, uh, plans for intellectual property or to develop a commercial product or service, um, and that they uh, 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 include a commitment to include an acknowledgement in publications and presentations. And in fact, I should note that Jay Shinduri's paper includes such an acknowledgement, and it's sort of the model of the first application of that, of that uh, policy. Um, so the um, policy also requires that future whole genome data be deposited into dbGaP, and we already have another submission that is in process, um, so that would be the third uh, HeLa sequence that will be in dbGaP. Um, in order, so the way that dbGaP works for GWAS data, and this was a real learning experience for me and uh, hat tip to Laura Rodriguez for walking me very slowly through this because it was new, uh, uh, dbGaP sort of emerged after I left uh, NIH the last time. So ordinarily there's a data access committee that looks over requests for access to data sets and determines whether or not the researcher's proposal meets those uh, criteria that were laid out in the original consent. In this case, there is no consent. So what we are um, relying on are these conditions that were set forth by the family. And it's important um, uh, that this is a very unique circumstance and a point that we've tried to make over and over again about how this is not a precedent for anything. Um, this is a, a, um, an agreement that we've reached with the family to address a particular unique circumstance uh, in, uh, in science and ethics. Um, so the, so our working group is going to operate much like a data access committee, but current NIH data access committees are made up of NIH employees. Um, it became uh, apparent to us that, um, that it would be uh, advantageous to include members from the family in the review process, and so that meant it couldn't be a DAC in the old-fashioned ways, and there are legal issues in mixing feds and non-feds. So we ended up creating a working group of the advisory committee to the director, which is the highest advisory group to Francis. And we have had advisory groups on a slew of important issues over the years. Uh, we currently have a working group to the uh, NIH director working on developing the scientific plan for the brain initiative. Uh, we have now the HeLa data access uh, working group. And they will review each of these requests as they come in. Um, the requests are submitted through um, a dbGaP study page. So there is a parent page about HeLa, and then there are now two, soon to be three, uh, sub uh, pages. And on this page are um, special instructions for uh, researchers that really lay out the requirements that we want them to address in their uh, data request, their data access request. Um, and then also information about the data access working group and uh, also the mechanism of how to submit another HeLa genome if you have one. <clears throat> so the HeLa uh, data access working group um, was put together on the day that we announced all these things that we announced. Um, it is chaired by Renee Jenkins, who is an adolescent medicine uh, doc at Howard University. 
Um, also included are folks who you certainly know, Russ Altman, uh, Ruth Faden um, from um, Johns Hopkins, who was involved in the discussions with the family, and so she has a pre-existing relationship with the family that I think will be um, really helpful. Um, David Lacks, the grandson who you saw in the picture with Francis, Veronica Spencer, who is a great granddaughter um, from the another son uh, of Henrietta's, and um, Clyde Yancey, who is a member of our advisory uh, council. Um, I'll just skip that. We got lots of press. So where are we now? We have since August 19th received. Uh, actually, that says four. We now have over the weekend a new one. We have five requests for access to HeLa data. Um, the working group is meeting for its inaugural meeting on September 12th this week. Um, they will be reviewing those five data access requests, and um, we are optimistic that they will be operating by consensus so that they can, as a group, send forward consensus recommendations to provide, uh, to recommend to the advisory committee, to the director, that um, access be granted or not, or they can also um, request that there be more information solicited from the investigator. Um, there are a couple, so one thing that has been really important, uh, particularly to Francis, but I think it's important to all of us, that this controlled access work effectively and efficiently. So we want to be able to not have this stand in the way of research moving forward. And of course, you know, as researchers, we would like to not have anything slow us down by more than about three nanoseconds. So we're trying to have this process move as quickly as possible. It is a new process, so this first round through, um, you know, we were sort of getting our sea legs uh, underneath us, but we, um, we, if all works according to plan, when we move these data access requests forward later this week and on to the advisory committee, which meets on September 16th, um, they will take action on them. We will have finished the entire review process in under a month. Hopefully we'll be able to even shorten that over time. So one of the things that I think would be um, interesting to get your input on uh, uh, over time or any thoughts that you have is what kind of data, HeLa data, needs to go into dbGaP. We were, of course, responding to these assembled, two assembled genomes that we knew about and now more. Um, and, and so uh, when we were thinking about what data goes in, we basically took everything that was associated with the whole, uh, whole assembled genome from both of the groups, okay? So everything that they had, we slurped it into dbGaP. We were very candid with the family all along, and we learned lots of interesting things about how much HeLa sequence actually exists out there in um, public databases today and when the first sequences were around, and it's, it's just a massive amount of data. And so we were very clear with the family that it would be impractical and, frankly, impossible to take all that data that was already out there and put it into controlled access because it has been downloaded and published and recycled so many times that we really couldn't do it. So, so at this moment in time, the data that's in dbGaP for HeLa is the whole assembled genomes and sort of related sequence files. The question moving forward is, do we expand the policy to ask that researchers generating any HeLa sequence data also submit it to dbGaP? And uh, that's an issue that Francis has asked the working group to take up. I think they probably won't take it up robustly at this first meeting because they've got to sort of um, work through these initial applications for access. But um, I'd be interested in uh, thoughts that any of you have either now or uh, send me an email or give me a call. It's going to be an issue that we're going to have to struggle with and get some resolution for the research community in the, in the, in the near term. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Yes, it is all I wanted to say. Um, so I'd be happy to answer questions or um, respond to comments or whatever. Okay, thank you, Kathy. I'm sure there'll be discussion. So council members or others, Amy, start with you. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. That was very helpful. Um, 
So in coming up with, obviously this was a unique case and there's a lot of unique sort of circumstances surrounding the case, but in coming up with this policy solution for this case, um, did you guys have broader discussions about policy around the rights of relatives of individuals who were generating sequence data on and um, either prior to their death, after they die, and how we're going to handle that and how we're going to create policy that's more scalable than this solution? Or do you see this as just unique? I, I really do see it as just unique. So we had the conversations probably 15 years ago about consent from family members and sort of gen what role do family members play. And I think that um, my own position is that if an individual opts to um, participate in genetics research or to learn about their genome outside of a research setting, um, that that decision should not be overridable by family members. Um, there certainly are people who have taken the approach that um, if you're going to be in this genetic study or if you're going to get this genetic information as a part of your clinical care, that you should seriously think about how you talk to your family members about that. Um, but I don't think that this circumstance, you know, there were some erroneous representations of what we were doing here is suggesting that family members um, can sort of dictate what happens to sort of probands genetic information and, and that really is not the case. Um, we have this situation has um, certainly um, fed into the department's considerations about its revisions to the common rule more broadly, but the issue of what what are the regulatory um, and legal requirements for family members is really not something that we're taking up as a, as a policy uh, initiative at the present time. Carlos. So I want to thank you also for the presentation. I think it's, you know, fascinating and it's great to see the right thing get done. Um, sort of following up on Amy's question, um, not so much focused on family members but focused on cell lines. So, you know, there are a large number of cell lines out there that are sort of in this nether region where they were produced well before, say, 1,000 genomes consents and other consents that explicitly say, look, you know, this, these are going to be broadly disseminated and dot, dot, dot. So I'm thinking things that are in Coriel or um, other cell lines that are out there, some of which we ourselves have sequenced. Um, what are the thoughts there in terms of policy? Is it a sort of case by case, or is there a sort of thinking of grandfathering some of these in? Have you had those discussions? And um, if not, is there a plan to have that? So that's a great question. So um, the one of the unique features of of Gila is how widely known who she is and who her family is, and so we have tried to look into whether or not there are other similar situations, other similar uh, cell lines. And from our review, there is probably one um, that is n not on the same scale, but where the donor's identity is known, where the cells are widely used, and where the donor has known or knowable progeny. Um, so, so we, that's sort of a special case. And then there's all the cells and specimens that are out there that have been procured for research either with consent being waived or uh, used in a de-identified de way. Um, and I think that the department's seriously thinking about how do we handle those that we already have versus how do we handle ones that we will acquire in the future um, given that DNA uh, analysis now makes samples so readily identifiable. Um, so it's something that, that we're um, thinking about. Kathy, can we back up a little bit and talk about the data that exists for the HeLa cells in, I think it was about 160 gigabases. And, and, then, and then thinking forward, there's a number of large projects that are ongoing today that are using HeLa cells. And what the criteria might be for deciding uh, what would be in, go into dbGaP or what's the working group thinking? I know you're not, you know, a mind reader, but it, it's, it, there are a lot of considerations about pr ongoing projects. And yeah. How yeah. would they be distinguished from, for example, all the kinds of data that are already in 
uh, NCBI? Right. It, it, that's a great question, and it's it's one that we really are just starting to to um, ruminate about. And you know, you guys, this council is in a very interesting position to be able to to it even just raise what are the considerations here that we sh that the working group should um, know about. Um, you know, we did look at what what data is out there already, but we haven't done a systematic look at what are the current funded or ongoing research projects where HeLa data is sort of embedded um, in those initiatives uh, in a thorough way. Um, so this is really something where we're just starting to starting to think through um, the ramifications of all of this. Maybe I missed it, but uh, what is being done to help the Lax family interpret the available genome in terms of uh, health or medical uh, relevance? Um, so um, a couple of things. One is that in our early discussions, um, and Jerry Lax says that she felt like she was in Genetics 101, um, we were in a conference room in, at Johns Hopkins and there was a whiteboard and lo and behold, Francis was up drawing pictures. Um, so we, I think a lot of our time uh, with them was uh, providing some of the basics about, well, what is a genome anyway, and what can it tell you about you, and what does it mean if it's not your genome, but your parents' genome, or your grandparents' or your great-grandparents' genome. And then as a, a part of that conversation, um, we, made, um, we made the family aware of ongoing research studies in which they could um, obtain their own genomic information rather than trying to divine uh, probabilities from their great, great grandmother or grandmother. Um, so we shared with them that they could participate in some of these research studies where they would affirmatively consent um, and learn this information potentially about themselves. We also made available to them a genetic counselor and a medical geneticist um, who um, were provided with data in a 60-page printout from um, uh, somebody, and I actually don't know who it was, who pushed the sequence when it was up on the EBI site, pushed that sequence through Snopedia and had a variant readout. Um, and so our medical geneticist and genetic counselor walked through that data with the family. Um, uh, or some members of the family uh, who were interested. So that's, that's sort of what we, we have provided. Um, we've offered that they can meet with the, those folks again. Um, we've offered that they can participate in um, protocols like ClinSeq. Um, and, uh, and then I think that in an ongoing way, especially the members of the working group, the family members on the working group, are going to continue to be um, in a, well, let me back up. Everybody in the working group is going to be in a learning mode um, here because this is sort of uncharted territory. Um, David Lack sent me an email after uh, I sent him some materials about the working group and about um, what the first meeting was going to be, and he's he is actively engaged in um, understanding the nuances and sort of exploring this. So I think I think we're enjoying that exploration process, but um, we are trying to provide what we can. It's you know. It's, they got dumped into unfamiliar territory here, so. Karen? I was just ask, wanted to ask you a question about in the list of the considerations when they're reviewing the applications, was commercial, plans for commercial, disclosure of commercial plans. Was Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I think that's really interesting and where that's coming from. Yeah, so I think um, the, the family historically has had um, the, the issue of is somebody getting rich and we're not has been a theme for some members of the family forever. And it certainly came up in the context of our discussions. Um, we interestingly, between the second meeting we had with the family and the third meeting we had with the family, we got the Supreme Court decision um, about the patentability of uh, non-manipulated genomic sequences. And, and that actually helped us a lot, right? Um, so in trying to think through, so the family asked us questions like, can you imagine 
what would be immediately sort of a first order commercializable thing from the HeLa sequence. And, you know, we thought long and hard about what that would be. Um, and we were, uh, we came up with a few ideas and then we disproved our own um, ideas. So we didn't come up with anything that was sort of obvious, but we also aren't all knowing. And so we didn't want to say absolutely nothing will come out of this that will be commercializable and you'll read about it in the Wall Street Journal. And one of the things that we have been extremely sensitive to is that this family keeps on getting surprised, right? Whoops, another surprise. So, um, so we cannot legally tell a, somebody who's ac trying to access sequence that they have to um, vary their intellectual property or give up their intellectual property or whatever. Um, but they can, we can ask them to disclose it. And so if they disclose it and it's known, then if the family seeks to reach out to them and have a conversation, that's outside of our sphere. And just knowing about it was really important to them. So we, so, uh, we also have a requirement that if when you submit your application or your data access uh, request and you say, no, I don't have any immediate plans, if those plans change, they're required to update it. Okay, but the implications of this are this might be grounds for no access. No. No, no, okay. Because it is interesting in the common rule, I mean, in the informed consent documents right now, it's, it's often disclosing you have no commercial interest, this could be commercially developed. So we've sort of set that as a standard in contextually anyway. That's right. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Is the demarcation for the biomedical research only that that means not ancestry research, or is there something else? Just that. Uh, could it be something else? I haven't really thought about it. But yes, yeah, so there have been categories that have been used uh, in dbGaP in the past, and we sort of um, presented those to the family, and Ancestry um, uh, was out. But there are other, based on informed consents, there are lots of data sets in dbGaP that have much narrower um, data access criteria. So only breast cancer, only this or that. So this is actually incredibly broad. Um, and uh, the working group, of course, can, can modify, what, uh, make recommendations for modifications to this policy over time if it, it, it turns out that that's needed. Um, but. Kathy, I know, you, I know you don't want to try and set precedent with this, but I'm just wondering, looking at those criteria, as we've been talking to human gene genetics researchers, the l researchers a little bit about using dbGaP, I can, thinking about some of those conversations, I can hear them saying, I would like to be able to exercise that provision on my dbGaP data. I'd like, I'd like to be able to tell my study population that any commercial plans would be disclosed, to me at least. Is there, is there any possibility or thought about, I mean, obviously DB, dbGaP has its own rules about use, but you could almost imagine a, a menu, a checklist of a couple of things like this that maybe investigators could sort of put on their, their own dbGaP databases. Is that something that's been talked about at all? Uh, not, not directly, but there are, you know, there are um, cohorts out there that have restrictions on who can access data. So I'm looking at Terry. Isn't it true that Framingham now has some ability of cohort participants to say that the data can't be accessed by private sector? Uh, they, actually, there are a couple of cohorts that have those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are things, it's not so much you can't commercialize it, but if you are, are a commercializer, you can't get it. Um, so. Any other questions, comments? So as, as Kathy offered, I'm sure they're interested to hear any other thoughts you have. Send her an email, or I'm sure she'd get on the phone and talk to you. This is still a work in progress, but. Okay, thank you, Kathy, for visiting with us. Yep. And we're staying okay, right on time. This is right. great. We're doing well. So next up is uh, Terry Manolio is going to give a report from the Genomic Medicine Working Group.